Hello, everyone. Today, I am joined by two guests. I have Linnea Gore and Twyla Farmer. Linnea has written Laying Down the Rails for Children, as well as other books that help homeschool families easily implement the Charlotte Mason method. She loves hot herbal teas, cozy books, hiking in the woods, and blogging about her family. Linnea and her husband live in rural Missouri and are in the midst of homeschooling their four children. Twyla has been illustrating books and publications for over 20 years. For half of that time, she traveled internationally, illustrating on location for nonprofit organizations. This experience not only filled her passport, but more importantly, taught her the impact of clarity and culture in visual communication. Those projects continue to inform her work as she seeks to visually share the truth and beauty of God and his creation through her art. She lives in Missouri as well, and when she's not drawing, Twyla homeschools her son, gardens with her husband, practices karate, and tries to keep their four cats from sneaking into the house. So I'm so delighted that you both are here today, and I would love, I know we're going to give the official bio there at the beginning, but I'd love to hear from both of you a little bit about yourself, your family, and especially how you came to start homeschooling. So Linnea, why don't you get us started? Sure. So um, we just moved here to Missouri. Uh, we've lived in Florida and Texas and Iowa, um, but my husband grew up in this town and we were able to move back into the house he spent his childhood in. And uh, we get to watch farming around us. So I'm absolutely loving that. Um, I've always lived in the city. So this has been a really fun experience, but we have four children. Um, the oldest has actually just got her associate's degree from um, a Bible college. So she's moving on in her life. And then we have two high schoolers and a middle schooler. So we're in that stage where they're becoming independent and doing more work on their own um, and, you know, trying to figure out how to homeschool, you know, high schoolers. Mm -hmm. So um, in homeschooling, I actually was homeschooled growing up, but I did, I did public school homeschool and private school. And so I had all three of those and I just knew that I wanted to homeschool my children. And so um, when my husband and I were dating, we had this day we called the great day of questions where we just wrote down a bunch of questions we were gonna ask each other. And one of mine was, what do you think about homeschooling? And he said, um, well, I don't know much about it, but uh, as long as our kids don't wear blue jean jumpers, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't want them to dress weird. So it's like, okay, I, I think we could figure that out. So, um, so we jumped on board right from the beginning. I love that story. Yeah, that, the, the denim jumpers are definitely a thing back when I was being homeschooled in the 80s I and know. 90s. I don't mind them, but okay. <laughs> Twyla, how about you? Yeah, so I also live in Missouri and um, I grew up here, but I've lived a a lot of other places and, and I'm now back here as well, kind of like Linnea. Um, I have a husband and one son. He'll be in fourth grade this fall. And we, uh, as far as how I got started homeschooling, um, my mom homeschooled me for one year in high school. It, it actually ended up being more like one semester. It, we, it, we were able to finish so much content in a short period of time. Uh, we finished more than two years in just a little over a semester. And so I was able to go to college two years early just from that one small time of homeschooling. So I learned firsthand the value of um, homeschooling to allow students to go at their own pace. And um, so, so that I've always had that in mind, but then uh, when I started traveling and illustrating in different locations, it seems like for people who are working in other countries other than the one that they were born in, figuring out how to educate your children is a big, is a lot of big decisions. You know, do you send them to an international school? Do you send them to a school where uh, that is in a, a language different from the one that we speak at home? Do we homeschool? Do we do a hybrid? And so it seems like I was always surrounded by some of those decisions and uh, that people were making and learned a lot about a lot of the options. 
So when we found out we were expecting our son, we actually started looking into schooling options. Like while I was still pregnant, we started visiting schools and a few people were like, um, you really don't have to have that all figured out quite yet. But um, homeschool is always an option. Um, we decided for his kindergarten um, year to try this, uh, uh, this model called university model school. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So he went to school three mornings a week. And then I taught him at home uh, the other, the rest of the time. And there were a lot of perks about that, uh, especially the group time, group activities. But I really did saw how the, the curriculum was still along the lines of just uh, filling out worksheets and then um, taking tests that evaluate kids and sort of, you know, to me, it seemed arbitrary <laughs> standards. And so uh, when I started noticing that he had some signs of learning, um, processing differences there, um, some dyslexia and dyscraphia, I was like, I think maybe we can address this better at home. So we started homeschooling and we haven't stopped. So um, it has been a good one-on-one -on -one experience for us. So. Well, Twyla, I know you're still kind of early on in your homeschool experience yeah. and adventure, but have you seen any ways in which maybe your expectations or approach to home education has, has changed over those years? And I'm also curious, because I know you just illustrated this book about the life of Charlotte Mason, if, if you had been familiar with her work already, if that's been a part of your homeschool or... Those are really good questions, because I, I had heard of Charlotte Mason. Um, I knew that she had something to do with nature and that's about it until this project came along. And so when I started reading more about Charlotte Mason, um, I found that a lot of what she seemed to promote was in line with the directions I was already heading with our um, learning at home experience. Um, particularly because I really, was wanting to give my son like the tools and the environment for him to make his own connections because that's what he remembered. And it seemed like just memorizing, we tried um, one curriculum where it was a lot of memorization of rote facts. And I found that if he didn't have a comprehension of what we we're studying, it just didn't stick. It's like the glue wasn't there to stick in his mind. And so I'd already kind of noted that, okay, when, when he has kind of, the things in place so that he can make, make these connections between different subjects and different, different um, time periods and things like that, it just stuck in his brain. And then he'd tell everybody about it. And so we were already heading in that direction. And um, I'm definitely new to Charlotte Mason because of this, but we've incorporated several more things that she has recommended and plan to do more of that this year as well, this fall. How about you, Linnea? How has your approach to home education grown and changed over the years? Now you have middle school and high schoolers and even now a college graduate. Um, when did Charlotte Mason kind of come on your radar? Yeah, um, so when I homeschooled, I, we used a Becca and that, and it's still very popular, you know, homeschool curriculum. And then in the little private school I went to, we used ACE which is um, accelerated Christian education. It's a, it's still a work, um, I would say a textbook system, but it's little booklets for each subject. And, um, and I learned from both of them and, um, and I appreciated both of them. So I don't want to put them down, but I wanted something different for my kids. I didn't want the textbook, just hand it to them. They can, I, I don't need to be there. They can sit down and answer the questions themselves and read it themselves, which it, might be would, might be great for some families, but um, I wanted to be involved. Maybe it's because I love education or I love to read. But I was like, I want to read the books to my kids, and I want to um, I want to be there whenever they uh, the idea strikes them or they learn how to read. You know, you want to watch their first steps. <laughs> so that's why I wanted to homeschool. One of the reasons I wanted to homeschool my kids. But um, so I was looking for something different, and when our oldest was. Well, this is, this is kind of interesting. We, I was in a teacher resource store and I saw this booklet that said activities and unit studies for a two-year-old. 
And I was like, oh, Elizabeth's almost two. I can start homeschooling. So I bought the book and I started doing school with her, which is really just like crafts and learning the ABCs and reading a book, you know, that has to do with the theme, if you can find one at the library. So it wasn't t too schooly, I don't think, but, um, but I love a schedule. So it was perfect for me to plan little activities for her to do during the day. Um, and I was interested in unit studies. I was like, well, this is different from textbooks. So um, I explored that for a bit. And then I didn't, I wasn't too impressed with it. Um, so I started searching again by the time she was in kindergarten. And that's when I took a quiz online. That's, you know, find your homeschool method. And Charlotte Mason is what it told me. And I had never heard of her. So I started searching for her on the internet. What, who's Charlotte Mason? And uh, Simply Charlotte Mason and Ambleside Online were the two big ones that had a lot of information about her and the method and her ideas. So I read everything I could join the Yahoo groups and, and things like that and, and just started learning um, how do I do this and um, read her volumes. And at first you just like grab the practical things, you know, well, she said to read this book and she said to teach reading this way. So let's just do that. But you don't really have the foundation. You know, why did she think this? And so uh, you're doing little bits and pieces, um, but over time you keep reading and learning and you figure out, okay, this is this makes sense or this is natural or um, so how it's changed over the years. Um, I've, I've learned more about how to do it better for sure, but I've also not um, only done Charlotte Mason. We've done some outside classes that weren't Charlotte Mason. Um, because I want my kids to have other teachers and I want them to experience a classroom setting where they have to take a test and they have to take notes. So I want them to have some experience with that. Um, so we've always done or tried to anyway, do some outside classes as well. So, and I guess have changed and just like, okay with that, you know, like <laughs> um, that's all right when you've got to do that. So yeah, we all find the ways to to bring our educational philosophies and our principles into the actual realities of our life and make Absolutely. it work for our family, right? Yeah. That's right. Well, Linnea, so you take a quiz, which I love. You're like, who is the Charlotte Mason person? And you start researching her and her philosophies obviously influence your homeschool. Mm -hmm. How did you get from that to being interested in writing a picture book about Charlotte Mason? And then I also wanted to know specifically, as you were thinking about writing this story, why did you choose the medium of a picture book? Sure. Um, so I, the Charlotte Mason method is, a, is, is around a person, right? Her ideas. And so I really love and appreciate her as a person. The more I read about her, I was just, um, she's kind of like a mentor to a lot, you know, she can be a mentor to a lot of moms and teachers. And um, I had the adult biographies written for adults um, that I knew were out there. I um, Essex Chomley's and Margaret Coombs biographies. And so I'd read about her, but those aren't super accessible to everyone. At the time I bought them, they were hard to find and kind of expensive. And a lot of moms just aren't going to read to that depth, you know, but I want people to know about her. So, and then also kids, my kids hear about her. Um, I listen to podcasts. I talk to my husband. They read some of her books, you know, her writings. We talk about it during habit training. So um, her name's familiar and they're probably like, I have no idea who this is. Like, who is this woman? Her name keeps coming up. So I was thinking on two fronts, really, for kids to read for sure. And so that's where the picture book aspect comes in. But also um, for moms or people new or just being introduced to Charlotte Mason, I thought this could be an easy read and it's a beautiful atmosphere, you know, like a beautiful picture book is just, it's attractive. You want to sit down and read it. So um, that's the reason I was thinking of a picture book. Yeah, you're never too old for a really good picture book, right? <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> How about you, Tyler? How did you first get interested in illustrating this this book? So, what 
right now in my life, I'm sure both of you will understand this. Your priorities are um, shared between a lot of important things. We have a family. Um, so homeschooling is really important to me every day. Um, getting some time in to illustrate is important every day. And, there, it, and it's important to me that all these priorities integrate, that they go together, that they're not competing against one another. I want whatever I am spending my time on um, to benefit my family and to encourage them. And so that's one criteria I look at in deciding what projects to take on. Is, is, this, is this something that's gonna integrate with the other things that are a priority? Um, but I just don't, at this point in my life, I don't have time to illustrate things that are sort of meaningless. Like it needs to be really meaningful. So when Blue Sky Daisies contacted me about this project and, and I knew who Linnea was. I, we had not met each other, but we knew of each other. Um, and so there was an appeal there to, to take on this project simply because it was written by Linnea. Um, but also as I got to reading it and reading about Charlotte Mason, I was like, this is a, a really meaningful book that lines up with my values and is something that other families that are like mine that are homeschooling their kids are going to, uh, it's going to appeal to them and encourage them. And so that, that's valuable to me. But even the fact too that Linnea and the ladies at Blue Sky Daisies are also homeschool moms just meant so much to me. It's like, okay, I'm going to be collaborating with these, these others who have shared values, who also um, want everything to be built upon this foundation of, of um, a biblical gospel worldview. And that's, that's rare for a project to come along <laughs> that um, where all the people involved are have a gospel center worldview. And so, um, and then, then also, as I started reading about Charlotte Mason, and especially about the places that she lived, it's like, these are really beautiful places. This could make some really pretty pictures. And that sounds fun to be able to make these pictures from this particular time period in these particular places. And so, um, yeah, I just really wanted to do this project. Well, I'm really curious, just the sort of behind the scenes, the whole picture book collaboration process and how this works. So Twyla, was the book already set before you began the illustrations or were you guys collaborating along the way? Would you pass an illustration to Linnea? And how did, how did that practically work? Yeah. So um, on most picture books that I've worked on, actually all of them other than this, um, the publisher is sort of like a middleman. So the author writes the book, um, submits it to the publisher, then the publisher um, determines who's going to be the illustrator. Um, they take over the editing and the art directing. And usually, um, I've, I've never actually met an author before on other book projects. So this was really a really unique and fun experience for us to be um, both involved at the same stage. And so whenever I would get a set of drawings done, I would submit them not only to Blue Sky Daisies, but also to Linnea. And that was really valuable because Linnea has the knowledge of um, Charlotte Mason and her time period and had done a lot of research. So when it came to, for example, one, one spread in the book is shows a young lady and her dad driving up to Scale How. Um, and there's a quote on that spread um, from this young lady. And I originally drew this girl looking like, oh, maybe like 11 years old or something with her dad. And she has like this sun hat on and things. Well, when I um, gave those to um, Linnea and, and the other ladies, uh, Linnea wrote back and said, well, this, this lady would have, this young lady would have been older. She would have been like a, um, going to, like the age to go to a teacher's college and it would have been winter time. And so it just, I think by collaborating, we were able to get things just as accurate as possible, um, which is really important for a biography, a picture book biography. And um, I'm sure that there are things that aren't quite accurate because of my 
basic lack of knowledge. But I think by collaborating, we were able to just make it as best as and as true to life as possible. Linnea, what was the experience like for you? What was it like seeing your words kind of come onto the page in a picture form? That that was a wonderful experience because Twyla took it and just um, just went above and beyond even what I thought it could be. So um, she would send first, I think they were little sketches, pencil sketches maybe, um, which was real nice. They were small and it was kind of like, well, this is how it's gonna be laid out and here's what I'm thinking. So you can do a lot of changing um, during that time, you know, and then um, was there a, a second um, phase and a third? I don't remember how many phases, but it would get more elaborate. And then finally you'd get the final colored painting. And, um, and she, I did have some ideas, like I was like, well, maybe you could do this on this page, but she really took it. She knows what she's doing, you know, and she um, had some great um, illustrations, like what, one of them that really surprised me was the Northern Lights. She did this beautiful spread of the Northern Lights and, um, and it totally fit with the text and it's just, it's really gorgeous. And that would have never come to my mind. So it, it was a lot of fun to see what she came up with. And, um, and she did her research too. She knew what she was doing. There's one, another illustration where um, it's like the inside of Scale How, the teacher training college. And um, there's a fireplace and um, Leah Bowden, I, I think you know her, modern Miss Mason, she um, interviewed us and she mentioned to her, she's like, how did you know what this room looked like? Um, like I've been in this room and, um, and Twyla was like, I've never seen this room, but I just was researching the time period and I knew this was what it should look like. I just thought that was so neat that she did a picture, didn't really know what that's what the room looks like. So. It, it was, it was a, a really fun collaboration for sure. Wow, that kind of gives me goosebumps. That's really yeah, fun. I know. <laughs> Linnea, as you were researching and learning more about the life of Charlotte Mason, did you have a particular favorite story about her, either one that made it into the book or one that, that didn't perhaps? Well, um, there's not a lot of stories about her childhood. Um, we don't know a lot about it. She didn't talk too much about it. But um, so all of the stories I could find from her child, they are in the book. So <laughs> that's what we know. But one thing that really impressed me about her was um, she had kind of a, a lonely um, life. I don't want to say it was horrible or anything, but she was the only child at home and um whenever she you know she she started working at 12 as a teacher's apprentice and it was not easy you know she's making a little bit of money she's walking home at night and she has to go collect money from the parents like and she's in charge of little kids and she's 12 like oh I can't even imagine that um and then when she was 16 her mother passed away and in less than a year her father passed away so she's alone in the world and doesn't you know she was not left money so she's got to make her own way and she didn't have really family backing her and so she was alone and just to see how she um did not despair she took that and you can see in her life how she made family and community around her. She would live with friends or with the, you know, with a family. And then when she started the, the school to teach, um, to train girls to be governesses and teachers, like she called it the house of education because she wanted it to be a home. And um, so this, I think this loneliness and this hard time in life made her a blessing to other people into herself like she made community around herself and to see that she turned that hard darkness into beautiful light I love that story about her yeah something that she could have used to feel sorry for herself yeah. or become ins insular and yeah. said it was an opportunity to look out outwards and That's serve others that's beautiful Twyla, do you have a, a favorite story that you, you learned from the, the book, from the text, or a particular favorite page spread or illustration from the story? Well, I think my favorite 
um, illustration is the cover of the book because um, often when a illustrator does a book, you finish all the interior pages first and then the cover is done last so that it can be sort of a summary of not just like the story or the theme of the book, but also of the style and the color palette and everything so that it best represents what's inside and will hook people in to want to turn the pages. And so that was, that was sort of true with this book. Like we already had the final uh, drawings all figured out, kind of all the, the, the problems solved and laid out. Um, and then we started talking about the cover. What are we gonna put on it? I think we were still trying uh, to decide what title or subtitle to go with. And I was, um, I took my son to this garden that's just maybe 15 or 20 minutes from where I live. We go there often, it's really small. It's, it's kind of an Asian styled um, garden. It's called Chance Garden in Central Missouri. And we were there last fall and it was just so pretty. And we talked about for the cover to have some sort of frog pond or something with the kids exploring with Charlotte Mason in the scene, sort of observing or guiding. And I, I saw this, this um, koi pond and I was just, that's it. That, that will fit what we've been working on for the previous, I don't know how many months at that point we've been working on this, eight or 10 months, uh, at least since I had been involved in it. Um, and it was like, this, this is gonna work. So I took some pictures, um, but because my, the girls who had modeled for the other figures in the book weren't available to come up at that point, and pose in that particular place for me to take reference pictures. I ended up having to piece together all these different pictures from different places to get that cover. And I just wasn't sure if it was gonna turn out. <laughs> and so when it ended up, we have, um, I feel like a good um, visual summary of Charlotte Mason and of who she was and as, as an instructor, but even like a, a mentor and a guide and it I, I think it worked and I, I was happy with how that how that turned out and and not only that but for me where I know the people who were um let me take pictures of them <laughs> to get the lighting right and stuff uh like my niece is on the back cover of the book and one of her friends posted to show up me since like that's meaningful for me too to have these these people that I know my son is one of the little kids on the cover. And um, so that was my favorite. And I would hope that if Charlotte Mason were here and could see it, that she would be like pleased with how she was presented um, in that image. So that's that one is my favorite. Wow. And I love how it has so many personal connections for you too. Yes, because that... Um, that garden is one that we go to frequently to observe how nature changes and how um, how the seasons change things and how just even from week to week the different flowers that are blooming and stuff. That's 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 our particular place to go to document that. And so it seems fitting that that would be the place that we put on the cover of a Charlotte Mason book. Twyla, do you think there's anything about homeschooling in general or any Charlotte Mason homeschooling maybe in particular that might surprise someone kind of outside the homeschool Charlotte Mason world? Well, one thing I was surprised by when I looked her up online um, is that she's kind of the um, initiator of the whole scouting movement um, of, you know, everybody's familiar with Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or Frontier Girls or all these different groups, but Maybe, maybe people who aren't familiar with Charlotte Mason, they're familiar with these other groups. And that was my understanding when I read about her. Is that accurate, Linnea? That she's yes. kind of the person that started she, that idea. She, um, so a governess who had been trained at the House of Education um, was being a governess for this family. Um, Baden Powell, I, I believe was the, the last name of the family. And um, so she was teaching the little son and um, he was walking home and all of a sudden his son up in the tree says, I've got you, dad. And he's like, you should have been looking all around you. You should look up as well. 
And he's like, where did you learn that? Well, his governess had taught him because at the House of Education, they had been do, you know, learning some scouting maneuvers and, we, and they thought this would be good to teach children as well. So she was teaching the son. Well, that man, um, Baden Powell, he started the scouting movement um, because he saw, oh, children can learn this and it would be good for them to learn it. So yeah, so yeah. she had the influence that got that started. That's really interesting. I, I think that that's really significant because um, I think of her time period, the late 1800s, early 1900s, as being a time where there's this overlap between industry, industrialization, and then people following like old traditional ways of, of doing things. And so the fact that, that she kind of started this initiative during um, that time, and it has remained strong and popular and gained popularity through all the changes in technology and and um, industry. I think that's really significant. Yeah, there's a timeless quality, right, to her principles. Linnea, is there anything that has surprised you or you think would surprise someone else about the way Charlotte Mason homeschooling has looked in your family? Yeah, I, um, one thing that came to mind was just how simple her method is, and yet it is very rigorous. I think some people look at it and they think, well, that's for little kids. They don't think we could continue this in a middle school or high school. Um, but her method, while it is simple and natural, it is not, um, not easy. It is rigorous. Like, you definitely can use this for the older grades. And like you said, her principles are timeless. They will carry through um, once you get down to what are the principles and no, just look at the little practical things. Um, so, so for instance, like um, she would have children studying three languages at a time. And you don't start with three, of course, you start with one and they would learn how to speak it and understand it. And then they would narrate in the language, you know, they would listen to a story, say in French and then narrate back in French. And once they could do that fairly easily, they would um, move on to like the writing portion in French and then maybe add in Latin. And I don't know the exact, um, I don't know exactly how they did the languages, but, and then once they could speak Latin, they'd move to the writing portion and they would uh, start another language like German, you know, like, so I'm like, oh my goodness, this is hard. Like this is, uh, anyone who thinks this is only for little children, they don't really know what she recommended. So I think that can be a surprise. And even narration, like I have tried narrating to myself, like different books I read. I'm like, I don't know how my kids do this, but I, I told them they had to, so they learned, but I have a hard time doing this myself. So while it seems so simple and it really is simple, it is uh, plenty rigorous, even for older children. Well, Linnea, I realized, I think I've just completely like neglected to say the actual title of your book. So how about <laughs> if you tell us the official title of your book? Right. And then, you know, we've been talking about Charlotte Mason a lot. And do you think this book is just for Charlotte Mason homeschoolers? Or who do you hope reads this book and gets something out of it? Yeah, so this is Charlotte Mason, the teacher who revealed worlds of wonder. And... Um, Definitely, it's going to appeal to Charlotte Mason homeschoolers, right? Um, they know about her, so they'll recognize the name, and it's a beautiful book. Um, it is kind of written toward, oh, I don't know, 8 to 12, 14-year-olds, I guess. Um, but I think moms would even get a lot out of it. And I know little kids who are enjoying looking at the pictures, so families in general. But um any homeschooler, especially if you're wanting to introduce someone to Charlotte Mason, I think this could be a good introduction um, because I tried to put in this book also not just about her life, but where her ideas came from as far as um, I knew um, from the research I'd done um, and what her main ideas were. You know, there were several mottos. Um, um, I tried to put all the main mottos in there and explain what they meant. Um, Education is the science of relations, for example. And then, um, so I think it could be a good introduction for Charlotte Mason for those who aren't um, very familiar with her. Um, even anyone interested in education, I think any teacher who's, in, you know, they, they could read this and 
and it can make them rethink the way they educate. Like maybe um, these grade, the way we grade and, and we have rewards, maybe there's a different way um, to get children to love learning. Um, so any educator really who's interested in other methods of education and then um, even if you're not homeschooling, I think moms, because Charlotte wrote a lot about how to um, how to train your children. Um, it really surprises me how much she wrote on that subject, you know, habit training. Um, how does the mind and the heart and the soul work together? You've got to train the will and, and, um, and you can't just think whatever you want. You actually have to, when ideas come to your head, you have to examine them and say, is this a good idea? Is this worthy? Um, am I going down a bad path? Like you get to make those choices. She talks so much about those type of things. So even mothers who just have little kids at home, this would, this would be a benefit to her as well. You know, I love giving books as gifts at baby showers. Um, mm -hmm. And especially like if someone's having a second, third baby, yeah. they, a lot of times they don't really need any more baby stuff. So that's a perfect time to give books. And I could see this being a really great uh, baby shower gift or baby Absolutely. gift for someone. Yeah. And yeah. it might be a little less intrusive than like, here, let me give you all the pink books. Her, her six <laughs> volumes, <laughs> thousands of pages, yes. Maybe a little less intimidating for a young mom. Absolutely. <laughs> or for any mom, young yeah. or not. <laughs> oh, here at the end, I'm going to ask you guys the questions that I am asking all my guests. And so, Twyla, I'll start with you and just ask, what are you reading lately? Okay. Well, I'm reading some things with my eyeballs and some things with my ears. I don't know, <laughs> you know but I'm listening to a lot of audio books lately. Um, but the things I'm reading with my eyeballs are, um, I've been reading Against All Opposition by Greg Bonson. It's a um, book about apologetics. And I've been reading um, Principles of War by Jim Wilson. And um, as I'm always reading a historical novel, it's just like the fun thing that, in, and it always gets me interested in time period and then I start looking everything up to see if the author portrayed, portrayed it like how much of it was actually historical um and right now I'm reading one by Melanie Dobson I can't remember the title right now um but it's about World War II and as far as what I'm listening to with my ears right now I just started um The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis and I finished uh, just last week even Exile by Rebecca Merkel, and I really recommend it. I thought it was really, really good, so um, I highly recommend that book. And um, and I've been listening to Pinocchio with my son, um, which I've never really liked. It's such a dark tale of it's a um, little weird of, <laughs> of this um, creature that just will not obey um, and will not have wisdom, which I think is the point of the story, but. Anyway, it's, we're listening to that. <laughs> I love, we use those same phrases in our family. We talk about reading with our eyes and reading with our ears because sometimes one is better than the other at different times and for different kids. But I would um, also highly recommend Greg Bonson. He has so many great things. My teens have been going through his book, Always Ready, um, in their Sunday school class. And I read that as a teen. It's just an excellent, uh, he's an excellent resource for apologetics. Yes. How about you, Linnea? What are you reading lately? I love talking about books and I love, she had so many recommendations, so I'm going to have to write these down or something <laughs> so I can read. Um, okay, so um, let's see. Okay, I'm reading Kristen Lavernstarter, which is um, a series of three books about a girl in medieval Norway, if I've got all of that correct, and it just kind of follows her life from a young child to getting married and all the kids she has and her relationship with her father and um and with God it, you know there's a lot of um the church is very involved in her life so that's been my fun read I don't I, I guess that would be historical fiction too but um that's been a lot of fun to read I'm making my way through the C.S. Lewis books, and so I'm on Miracles, 
And um, I'm pretty sure I've read this one before and I've forgotten most of it. Like two paragraphs really stick out to me. And I'm like, I'm, I know I've read these, but boy, I, I need it to read it again, I guess. It's pretty dense. It's not one of his easy ones in my opinion, but I'm almost through with that one. And um, I am reading um, Thomas Hardy's Tess of the D'Urbervilles. I think that's a Victorian novel, and I'm listening to a podcast, you know, um, who's going through it, and so I'm kind of reading along with them, so, um, and it's really, it's a sad book. I wasn't expecting it, <laughs> but um, so I think that would, I'm sure there's a couple of others, but those are the three that come to mind, so. Yeah, I love talking to guests and asking this question, although it's dangerous because then I end up adding to my TBR list, yeah, of course. Exactly. But everyone is always like, well, I'm reading more than one. You know, I'm sorry. I think that's okay. Everyone comes and is reading more than one. That's part of what's so fun about this question. So you see all the different, the different facets of our reading life that are happening at the same time. So that's fun. All right. Well, the final question is, what is your best tip for helping the homeschool day run smoothly, Linnea? Okay. So, um, when I was preparing for this question, I was like, I think I came up with three or four, you know, so I was like, no, she asked for one. She asked for my best. <laughs> I don't know if this is my best, but, um, to make the homeschool day run smoothly, just have a routine. I love routine. That's, I work well with routine. Um, and our first week of school is always pretty hard because there isn't a routine yet. You're trying to figure that out, but once you can find it and, um, because things interrupt, you know, our, my husband works from home, you know, and we are like, oh, he's got a meeting at 930 every morning. So we probably shouldn't be singing during that time. Right. So you've got to figure all that stuff out. And um, but once you get it going, try to stick with it. And I have found um, that that first half of school, like those first four months or four and a half months before Christmas, um, everything is quieter around. Like um, there's not a as much going on as the second half for some reason. So I'm like, really um, concentrate on school and don't skimp, you know, like do a full math lesson every day. You know, if you've got the time, do it. Because that second half, um, I don't know, we get sick or something. People visit, we go on vacations. I'm not sure, but it's just a little busier. And I'm like, okay, I'm okay. Because we did so well that first half, we can just do a half of a math lesson today and we're going to be all right. So um, really uh, put a lot into it on the front end and you'll feel better about it on the back end. Oh, I relate to that so much. I think also you're just tired, like January and February, it's dark oh. and you've come off the holidays and you're like, we've been homeschooling forever. <laughs> so, same thing in the week. I always feel like Mondays and Tuesdays are super productive and then it just kind of goes downhill. So you got to like really get out there and be productive at the beginning. You're right. Yes. How about you, Twyla? Do you have a tip for keeping the homeschool day running smoothly? Well, I asked my son yesterday, I was like, what? What do you think is the best thing about homeschool? Like, what makes it go well? And he said, cuddling. Oh. So that's going to be my answer. <laughs> best so answer we, ever. Yeah. We have a, a recliner that's kind of big, and we don't really fit in it very well, but we try to both fit in it. He's still little enough that he can kind of fit in it with me. And anytime that I'm reading to him or he's reading to me or we're discussing something, we're usually in that chair cuddling. And I, it may be my imagination, but I think the rest of the day, the other subjects go better when we spend time just connecting like that. Mm -hmm. And um, on a similar note, like uh, my husband and I both noticed that if we're, if the weather is cooperative and we can get out and take it, take him on a walk, take my son on a walk before school starts, that it's just an opportunity for him to get his ideas out and tell his stories and be ready to, to sit down and listen and focus. And so those are kind of the, I guess, addressing the um, externals a little bit, but it seems like that helps us. Yeah. You know, people talk about like game schooling, travel schooling. I think we need to make cuddle schooling. Yeah, <laughs> yes. 
Oh, this has been so great to chat with you both today. Can you tell me where people or tell people where they can find you all around the internet and where people can find your book? Linnea, how about if you get us started there? Yeah. So, um, so it's Charlotte Mason, the teacher who revealed worlds of wonder, and you can find that on Amazon or you can go to blueskydaisies.net and they'll direct you where to get it as well. And, um, then I can be found on, um, let's see, I'm on Instagram and Facebook, Linnea.gore, that's L-A-N-A-Y-A dot G-O-R-E, and I think those are my handles for both of those, so um, I mostly talk about my kids, so, <laughs> or book stacks or something is what I'll post, so that's where I can be found. How about you, Twyla? Where can people find you? Yes, I'm on, I have a website. TwilaFarmer.com, T-W-I-L-A, and then farmer spelled like farmer, farmer in the dill. <laughs> so TwilaFarmer.com. And then I'm on Instagram, and I think my name on that is Twyla J. Farmer. And then on Facebook as Twyla Farmer Illustrator. So those are the main three um, platforms that I keep up with. So. Okay. Yeah, and I will have links to all of those places so people can find you and grab your book and the show notes for this episode at humilityandoxology.com. Thanks so much, ladies. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you so much.